You know, I've always been curious as to what happened to that Sonic guy. I'll boom boom you, you muscle bound ape. After all, back in the Genesis, he was rocking some of the finest 16 bit platformers around. That's why I've decided to make this video to take a look at his most recent game and see just how far he's come over his somewhere around 20 years of gaming. Oh, good lord, this is uncohesive and disorientating. Like a visit to any Sonic fan site ever. Still looks colourful and relatively engaging at least. Wait, this isn't the most recent game in the series? Oh, silly me. Oh, here it is. Jesus Christ, what happened, Sonic? Why is everyone recovering from third degree burns on their hands and legs? Amy, Knuckles, go left! Give me a sec. I'm on it. What? Sonic Boom was definitely a fitting name, considering this model popping. Wait, why is Nag's mate from the Jungle Book seeking revenge against Sonic? What was wrong with Eggman? You know, the only Sonic villain to ever have a character? Sonic! You know what's better than an ambush? An ambush with ice cream? That sounds delicious. But no! The post- Oh. Never mind. I don't know what happened to you, Sonic. You used to be an icon, a face to gaming, like Mario. Crash Bandicoot and Johnny Gat. There's no statute of limitations for murder. Why the fuck not? Sonic Team have somehow managed to be responsible for some of the best and worst games ever made. Makes you wonder if everyone there has an identical yet hopeless twin they send in to work on projects when they just can't be bothered. It honestly kind of terrifies me. So let's stay well away from Sonic Team and take a look at a game they didn't make in the series to see if other people can do a better job. This is Sumo Digital's Sonic and All-Stars Racing Transformed, and they ain't talk about no dumb werehog transformations. STOP THAT! This game came out on the PC boxes back around in the early days of 2013, after its Christmas console release. This game is a sequel to 2010 Sonic and Sega All-Stars Racing, also developed by Sumo Digital, that I never played. This means this review thing is going to be just considering Transformed and not all those things and ways they built upon the original. But the answer to that question is probably boats, planes, and Danica Patrick. Okay? If you're curious to other games Suno Digital has worked on, then they're also responsible for the positively received Little Big Planet 3, the interesting broken sword Angel of Death, and genre defining Super Rubber Dub. And I'm not talking about Dr. Eggman's beautiful, bald head. Thank you! With such a girth of games and genres like that, it's easier to trust them to do a bang-up job of Super Sonic Friends car. Unlike a certain monkey lobotomy of a studio, Sonic and All-Stars Racing Transformed is a racing game where the two main selling points are the Sega universe the characters and tracks are based in, as well as the way you transform mid-race into a flying or boat form, depending on how you're feeling. How much you enjoy this game is going to largely centre around what you think of these gimmicks. Let's preface this discussion with the story itself though, because it doesn't exist. That's all. The closest thing to a story in this game is how Eggman presumably drowns in the opening cutscene. I mean, he doesn't resurface after Sonic brutally waterboards him, so that's what Scotland Yard decided after their thorough investigation. This has left another calling card! A single monogram panty liner! Pick it up, Ginger! So I have to, sir. So yeah, if you're looking for some kind of neat collision of world plot like in Mortal Kombat vs DC to just hold it all together, you won't get it here. What replaces the story is this world tour mode, which is essentially the same as the mission mode from Mario Kart DS. If you're familiar with that mission mode, well, it's basically the same, but with absolutely no creativity or variety in the events. Most of the events are just different variations of racing, such as racing to keep boost up, drifting as fast as you can, or the classic staple of video games, flying through rings, which has just been a hit as far back as I can recall. It does have some more interesting events though, such as Traffic Attack, where you have to dodge cars from the Tron universe while speeding down very unsafe and cyclic highways, HELP ME! I'VE BEEN DRIVING HERE FOR TWO YEARS! Another neat one is Pursuit, where you get to fight a tank boss that never changes from event to event. This one kind of boss just completely irks me because it shows they have the potential to make bosses, but just simply shrugged off doing so any more than this tank. Other previous kart racers such as Diddy Kong Racing, Crash Nitro Kart, and LEGO Racers even have all had like boss things to mix up the single player experience and give it something unique to define itself with. 
They could have used this as an opportunity to get an exciting fight with perfect chaos in downtown, a showdown with Team Chaotix in Seaside Hill, or a chase after Clements through his mother's vagina. Instead they went with Tron Tank. Like five times. Great! How iconic! The world event mode is not really that different to typical races, and in fact in some places it just makes you do normal races anyway. I'm alright with these kind of mission modes in games. It was fine in uh, Mario Kart DS, it's just this one is kind of limited and gets old extremely quickly. It reeks of a missed opportunity to come up with a full story to tie everything together in just the most bullshittingly delightful way imaginable. Not only is this world event mode kind of lacklustre, but you need to complete it in order to unlock every character in the game. This involves beating a lot of the events on the hardest difficulty, something I can't even accomplish on one of them! I hate it when racing games gate off characters like this to force you to play their badly designed modes. Thankfully, most characters you want to play as are pretty easy to unlock in here, with the only two ridiculous unlocks being some dude from Knights Nobody Cares About and a Sega Dreamcast controller, which I'm okay with. Everyone else you'd want to play as is at least manageable enough to complete enough events to access, with the lad from Golden Axe being the hardest. Gilius Thunderhead is his name? Oh Sega, you sly dogs. Wait, what? They knew it was annoying to unlock them all? Those cheeky monkeys! This is something to keep in mind if you plan on buying it for the multiplayer alone, as it might just cause a spanner in the works for your perfect Sega and All-Stars Racing Super Fun Night Family Friend Time. Alright, so now that we've discussed the story to this game, it's time to look at the other two major parts to it. The first being the world it's based in, and the second being gameplay. I mean, come on, where were you earlier on in the review? Keep up! Even you can learn something from a sloth! The world of Sega Smash Racers is pretty hodgepodge, to say the least, with a very diverse mix of characters from their backlog, as well as characters that have nothing to do with them. You got your typical mix of Sonic characters, with uh, strangely two or more of the popular ones, Shadow and Eggman, being locked at the start. Eggman is pretty annoying to unlock too, considering you have to beat the entire of Grand Prix to get him. Perhaps a representation of what he would have accomplished if Sonic hadn't murdered him. There is a lot of Sonic characters in this game, but I feel that's pretty necessitated considering Sonic's, you know, role in the Sega franchise. They've also wisely neglected some of the more obscure personalities from the, uh, from the universe, such as Charmy the Bee and Barney the Dinosaur. What's wrong with you? The rest of the roster is where my gripes lie, because you've got some fun ones from Sega's dark past like Amigo from Samba de Amigo and BD Joe from Crazy Taxi. You've also got some classic throwbacks that I really dig seeing, like Joe Mushasi from uh, Shinobi, and the aforementioned Julius Thundercunt from Golden Axe. For every great throwback though, there's just there's just some weird questionable character choices you just have to wonder, was it part of some sponsorship deal or something? Like, were we really so desperate to find great iconic Sega characters that we needed to resort to two people from Space Channel 5, Jet Set Radio and Super Monkey Ball, as well as more bizarrely, Wreck-It Ralph and Danica Patrick? Why is Wreck-It Ralph in this game? Did Sega make his machine in the film? Do they know he's depressed and seeking counselling? Are they paying for such courses, or is it not covered under their license? Why are all his voice clips badly sampled lines from the movie? Danica Patrick is of course even more senseless, and I don't even think anyone was clamouring to play as her in this game. She's not even close to a Sega character, but I guess that's why they dropped the Sega from Sega All-Stars for this instalment. It just seems so random and non sequitur. This whole lineup seems like such a waste of Sega's great and cherished past in video games. I wonder if Rystar thought, 20 years down the road, he'd be stuck waving the starting flag and watching other people enjoy life. Where's Sketch Turner, Vector Man, Detective Washington? I'm gonna rip your motherfucking balls off! Where's Echo the Dolphin? How could you forget Echo the fucking Dolphin? Where's Mighty the Armored? Nah, I'm just kidding. He might as well be Mighty the Unemployable at this point. <laughs> unemployable because he was found on the floor of a squat house after dying from a heroin overdose. So yeah, I feel they could have really pushed the Sega Universe side of things better and gone completely fangasm on us. Ring, ring! Wait, hold on. I I'm ring, getting a call. Ring, ring! Yeah? I forgot Billy Hatcher? Who? 
Oh yeah, that guy that was in one mediocre game? Dunno how they could possibly neglect putting him in. One final thing to mention about the characters is each one does have different stats that say make them fast, duh, or handle better. One really neat extra feature of the game is how if you play more of a character they level up and this allows you to access more mods to tune the character to your specific playstyle. This effectively means you can enjoy any character you want in this game with the correct mod that suits you. Something I greatly appreciate being someone who hates like 80% of the cast. So now that we've drawn attention to some pretty strange roster choices, it's time to focus on the tracks themselves. You've got a good mix in this game, from the seaside coast to the sonic world, to the spooky mansion of House of the Dead, to the skies of Arcadia, to the stuff of pure nightmares. I feel like each track defines itself very well and separates itself from the others. One way the game accomplishes this is how the tracks are just filled with moments, cool stuff that sticks with you. Examples of this are the rock band playing in the basement of the House of the Dead mansion, the brilliant almost track hazard like boss fight in the Knight's Course, flying through the magma caverns of the Golden Axe stage over a rather suspiciously stiff dinosaur, and Echo the Dolphin in a fish tank. ECHO THE FUCKING DOLPHIN! These tracks all feel like they stem from actual ideas, not just cutout books of the universe. What helps make these tracks remain exciting on later playthroughs is how they transform from lap to lap with maybe bits breaking off mid-race, or being bombed by the Russians. You don't feel like you're playing a static track based on a part of Sega's history, but rather you're experiencing and living the world it was built in. Honestly, this track transforming stuff is absolutely stellar and helps elevate this game past most modern kart racers in terms of their track architecture. The fact that the game includes classic tracks from Sega All-Stars just shows this off really well, as these just feel completely bland and static in comparison. It's easy to see this tr TRANSFORMING th as some kind of gimmick to sell copies, but I feel it's really helped make this game leave an impact on you, and make sure you'll remember these fun designs for years to come. Ain't just the tracks that are transforming though, your cart sometimes does it a bit too! Not to say you won't be spending a lot of time just as your regular average cart Joe, but you're also going to be transforming into a boat, maybe even a bird sometimes. Sound. How do you like the old bird? Not what? Too no, I didn't mean that kind of bird! Shut it years, off! Huh? Shut it off! This is perhaps the major defining feature of the game, and it's easy to draw similarities to other car races like Mario Kart 8 in this regard. But the difference is that these are all clear, distinct sections. They're very separate, these mechanics, not interweaved. This essentially means you have to master three different mechanics to get good at this game. You've got to be good in the uh, in the standard four-wheel drive, the no-wheel drive, and, and the bird-wheel drive. I guess. I mean, just look at the problem this AI is having with this corner. This just shows you how difficult it is. This is the greatest mass suicide in AI history. I mean, Forza, Gran Turismo, they're all hardcore and shite. But do you have to learn how to fly a car plane in those? Didn't think so. There's also a lot of boosting in this game. I mean, it is a Sonic game. I suppose that's to be expected. Drifting gives you boost. Doing tricks gives you boost. You've got to keep that boost up. You've got to go moderately quickly. Sorry, Scratch, you're disqualified. A real hero always wears his safety belt. If you like going quite fast in a kart racing game, this is going to be for you. I feel I'm overwhelmed with speed when I play this game. I'm not talking about the drugs rushing through my blood system, causing fatal overdoses every second. One final thing to mention in the regards to the standard gameplay is the power-ups. They're a little bit bland in design, I mean... <laughs> The classic firework from the Sonic views. oh, I remember that, but that's kind of looking into it a bit too much. The actual power-up design is very elegant, really. There's no overpowered ones, except maybe the All-Star, which makes you go uber and glow and shit. But the other ones are very balanced. They're all difficult to land, they all do reasonable damage, but you're not going to rubber band back and forth based on power-ups. And in terms of pure design, it makes it so it's a lot less frustrating, just in general. One of my personal favourites is a power-up that makes a turd of bees fly onto the track and just sit around obnoxiously getting pretty in the way. The counter to this is obviously dodging them. No power-up brings assured success and relies more so on skill rather than Mario Kart pot luck. So what do you do with all these fine mechanics? Well, there's a previously discussed World Tour mode as well as Grand Prix, Time Attack and individual races. It's all pretty standard fare, though I do appreciate the sheer number of staff ghosts available to challenge you in Time Attack as well as the integration with top online times to compare against. I'm a little bit worried about just how haunted the game is with 180 staff ghosts inside it, but I guess breaking an evil curse is good motivation to keep playing. There's also online features past that, which I'm happy to say still somewhat hold an active player base with regards to the general racing modes, but if you want to do arena mode, you flippin' lunatic, you might have to wait 
well, forever. And a bit longer. There's also ranked play, you know, some number pops up next to your name that means something. But even when I came fifth, mine still increased. So I guess people are pretty good at this game now, or maybe the game just had super low expectations of me. The netcode seems pretty solid from what I've played, so you're not going to be racing against jump cut vloggers. Except me. You can also play the entire campaign in multiplayer. If you're mental, get ready for local or online multiplayer custom games, which involve a couple of interesting types like Capture the Chow, a variant on Capture the Flag, except the flag is the hollow, inflated carcass of a chow. It's everything I've ever wanted from a multiplayer mode. In addition to this uh, novel concept, there's an arena mode, boost race, and my personal favourite, the battle race. Basically, it's exactly the same as a normal race, but power-ups have the potential to kill you, which makes it far more tense and lets you get rid of your least favourite friend on the couch straight away. Why do they always go for me first? Oh, oh, just because I liked Sonic Bow? <laughs> the tears are my friends. It's just music to my ears. Wait, what's that you say? A terrible segue. There's some absolutely brilliant Electronica remixes of tracks you know and love. Some of my personal highlights of the uh, soundtrack is the Skyward Sanctuary theme, the Samba de Amigo theme, and the Shinobi Temple Tower. Uh, it, it's in a temple. So yeah, put them on your shuffles. It's a pretty killer soundtrack. It's just a shame that the character sound design does not live up to it in the slightest. I find the lines they say in the race are pretty generic and don't at all capture the character they're meant to be. I mean, just listen to Sonic's classic quip here when he wins. I did it. Oh yes, vintage Sonic. There's that old attitude shining through. 20 years on and he's still going, oh my, oh! Wait a minute, why does Knights turn into just regular Knights for All-Star? Why doesn't she fly around normally instead of being a car that limps, oh! Is, is that a car? Is, is that a car? Oh, oh! I'm not familiar with the Knights canon, but I don't think I ever will be after seeing that. Why does Shadow drive when he can just fly around with his jet Nikes instead? I guess they're all tired after 20 years and suffering such horrific burns. Sonic is probably borderline diabetic after two decades of just consuming chili dogs. Now that's way past art. Oh God, he's having an attack! presentation of this game gives me serious eye erections. Though as I said previously, the characters lack artistic continuity, the world itself is filled with consistent beauty that just carries from level to level. Though each level does feel separate like the many islands that all float on the title screen forever, they all share the lovely jubbly art direction. The character models do need a bit of love though, as they lack animation could seem stiff at times. Please blink, Vice. Vice! I didn't know this was a horror game! I'm scared that when I shut this off, he'll be staring at my screen with that empty soulless face. Anyway, for the sake of my sanity, these models could use a bit more work. If you're worried about how the game runs on PC, I found the port is pretty good and I don't suffer any slowdown when recording footage. The one somewhat major problem I have though, is the configure menu, well, it doesn't work, so I can't adjust the video settings as I'm supposed to be able to. I don't know if this is an issue for me or others, but it might be something to keep in mind if you have a computer on the weaker end of the spectrum, you pleb. If you have this problem, just go to the game's launcher in the Steam Apps common file and just load it up yourself, which will let you tweak everything to your heart's content. Sort of. Here's some, uh, just some advice off the beaten path. Use a controller. Thank me later. And also turn this slider down. It's pretty cool to enjoying multiplayer. Trust me. Keep going. Shame on you. Higher. Don't do this to me. Congratulations, you've turned up the awesome. So that's it. Sorry we concluded with boring stuff like the port, but my Kickstarter failed to meet its 20k stretch goal, so the original kart chase finish, it had to be scrapped. Transformed is a very unique kart racer that is completely worth your attention, and absolutely beats out every other kind of kart racer on the PC. Whether you get your bang for your buck is going to come down to how much you enjoy the time attack mode, getting all the Rice stars, and how well you make it in the pro scene. If you want my advice, go fast. It's a pretty good technique. Not you go, lad.
Oh wait, they made DLC too? Well alright then, I'll have a look at that as well. I'll ignore the two character ones because frankly the Yogg's cast one makes the character continuity even worse, a feat I didn't think achievable, and is so overpriced you'd think it was sold in the UK. The Shenmue one is alright, but it's still just a character. We got plenty of those! I mean this is coming from a guy who buys 20 quid Dota skins, so take what I say about value with an absolute pinch of salt. The DLC I'm going to talk about is Metal Sonic and the Outrun Track one. So for your money you get the blandest character possible with the worst lines and you get the simplest and most lethargic track imaginable. It's a pass. I mean you can't even tell it's Outrun, it could be City number 2782, so it's hardly worth the dosh. Alright we're done for real now, go home, go home. Him for you. The next time, don't wander off without letting your daddy know where you're gonna be. That goes for you too, pals. Always tell your folks where you're going and when you'll be back. Bad things can happen if you don't.